Good morning everyone and welcome to today's State of the Service Roadshow event. My name is Phil Lancaster and I work at the Australian Public Service Commission here in Canberra. Today's event has a very different look and feel to our usual approach to this event series, but I very much hope that you'll find the next 70 minutes or so informative and engaging and perhaps even inspiring. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the, the Ngunnawal people who are the traditional custodians of the land here in Canberra that I'm speaking from this morning. I'd like to extend that acknowledgement to the traditional custodians on whose country you are participating from, as well as their, to their elders and any other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander colleagues who might be participating in today's event. Before I get into the detail of today's event, did you know that the APS as an institution has its own presence on social media? So if you're interested in keeping up to speed on things across the service, I'd encourage you to follow us on Facebook, on LinkedIn, on Twitter and on Instagram. Details of, uh, of those platforms are coming up on the screen now. So this is a whole series of events right across Australia, starting with a Canberra launch event which took place in February and it took place in the former House of Representatives chamber in Old Parliament House in Canberra. Video from that event is available on the APS website, APSC website, and I do encourage you to check it out if you have a moment. At that event, you'll hear from the Honourable Ben Morton MP, Assistant Minister to the Minister for the Public Service, addressing the APS on the great work that was done throughout 2020, and also announcing details about the new APS Academy and the upcoming APS exhibition at the Museum of Australian Democracy. There's also a presentation from APS Commissioner Peter Woolcott on the state of the service in 2020. We've also had a number of state-based events and it's been really great to see the strong engagement from APS colleagues thus far around Australia. We usually do face-to-face -face events, so a purely virtual approach is not our preference, but there's no doubt that it has enabled many more people to participate. And to complement today's event, you can also find state-based statistical slideshows on the state of the service on the APSC website. Today's event will be in two parts. Firstly, a Q&A session with Mary Wiley-Smith, Deputy Australian Public Service Commissioner, where Mary will answer questions submitted from the online audience via Slido. We'll then move to the second part of today's event, which is a panel discussion on the topic of spirit of service. We have three of our Tasmania-based colleagues who've agreed to talk a little bit about what it means for them to be APS employees and to give some personal reflections on the last 12 months. Then we'll go to a Q&A session with the, with the panel where they'll answer some pre-prepared questions, but also questions, again, submitted from the online audience via Slido. That's it for the introductions. I'm very pleased to welcome Deputy Commissioner Mary Wiley-Smith to answer all your questions as part of this first Q&A session. Um, the first one that we'll look at is one on mobility. So we've got a question there, Mary. Almost 80% of the APS work in just work in one agency, so have worked in just one agency, picking up on the figure that you mentioned um, yet the, range of, the skills in a range of work streams are transferable. So how can we improve opportunities to move between agencies? Yeah, thanks Phil, and it's a good question. Um, so we're very focused on how to actually improve mobility in the service, and the senior executives in the Secretary's Board and also the Chief Operating Officer Committee have been talking about this for a while. We have some work in the APSC um, that's looking at a mobility framework that people will be able to use with resources for HR managers and also staff to be able to connect and make sure that a lot of the barriers to mobility are removed. Sometimes we can see that barriers are around people just aren't aware of the other offers um, in other agencies. Um, sometimes it's barriers to location, which I just mentioned about flexible work that hopefully um, with more agencies embracing flexible work, it will mean that location um, won't be such of an issue. And it's pretty good this year because with COVID, what we have seen is that mobility has actually been increasing. 
So I think we've got 22%, uh, I think, of people have actually had to move or do something different this year across the service, which is a pretty large number compared to what we've seen in previous years. So we hope to continue that momentum. We're also looking at the incentives um, within the system. And so if we get the incentives right to encourage mobility, and in particular we're looking at the SES and whether how we actually um, ensure that the SES are mobile and what's important, hopefully that'll filter down through the other levels as well. But hopefully um, within the next couple of weeks, you will be able to log on to the APSC's website and see some information on mobility there, the different types of opportunities, um, how you can streamline it and um, there'll be some resources there that hopefully can assist people to make choices about where they want to go and what they want to do for their career. Thanks Mary. Um, there's also a question that's come through which says, I guess a follow-up about to that question, how can we improve mobility in Hobart specifically? Now I don't know if there's anything you can say about that. So that's probably, um, it's probably worth getting some of your senior executives within Hobart, Tasmania, and I think you've got a pretty large um, presence as well at the APS in Lonnie. Um, but get them together to talk about what they can do. Um, even secondments are very easy. You don't actually have to leave your agency, but just spending six months in a different agency gives you um, new skills, new experience, and it builds your capability. And I think that if um, local execs could get together and actually talk about um, how they could actually manage it, it would be beneficial to the people that are, w are living and working in, in, in Tassie. Some of them are actually on screen later on, and so you might even want to put that question to them um, in, the, in the panel session. Thanks, Mary. I just um, got a thumbs up from one of the panel members because I can see them, so that's all good. <laughs> Uh, and these, these are not pre pre these are not pre organised questions either. So it's great that um, to see that there will be we'll be able to link into that during our panel discussion. Um, question on the academy. Yeah. Can you give some examples of the capabilities that are unique to the APS that the that the academy will deliver training on? Yeah. So look, um, an easy one to talk to you about that we're working on right now is um, in the policy space. And we're talking about how policy actually operates um, in a practical sense. And so it's, it's, um, it's going to be quite different from what you would normally do if you wanted to go to a policy course and learn about policy at a, in an academic institution, because it's real life examples of what happens, how you deal with ministers, um, how you deal with advisors, how you have to work across the system um, and different departments. Um, when you're in um, a policy process, what the role of the central agencies are and making sure that everybody um, um, basically the environment that we're working in. So it's kind of, um, it's, it's, it's more practical than what you would get um, when you're actually working um, or, or doing a course at a university. And no one can teach this. Um, it's not something that people in industry really know. It's not something that our colleagues in academia know. But senior bureaucrats um, are really excited about it because it's an opportunity for them to actually spend some time and also ministers and advisors to actually directly connect with um, young policymakers to actually talk to them about what is officially what we call the APS craft. So that's one example. Mm. It's, it's what makes us unique. Um, another example that's pretty passionate, um, I'm passionate about, is when a public servant has to appear before a Royal Commission. So we've got to the point where some ex-journos um, and also um, academics are talking about that have been ex-public servants um, have courses on estimates and how you prepare for estimates as a, as a public servant. But um, we think we really need to focus on how to prepare for Royal Commissions because there's heaps of them at the moment. And they actually impact staff at, in the APS ranks and also in the EL ranks. It's not just the SES. So wouldn't it be nice if we had a course that people ran through to give them some confidence and understanding of the process before they have to actually appear in court. So that's another example. Thanks, Mary. There are a couple of other questions on the, on the academy. Um, so the first one is what sort of L&D opportunities will be available to staff in Tasmania through the new academy? Will it um, only be online courses? No. So. So we're going to make sure that we've got really good online offerings, um, but we would hope to be able to deliver some of the courses 
in, in person and I think that's pretty important. So we might have a bricks and mortar institution here, um, which is the old parliament house, but what we really want to do is actually reach out to where the Australian Public Service is and to make sure that we offer all the courses um, that are available both in person or online, depending on choice. Um, and to be fair, we only have, um, I think it's 37% of the public service here in Canberra. So most of the Australian public service is outside and we need to really cater for that. Hmm. And, um, and I think the, uh, the academy model is one that's based on, a, on partnerships, isn't it? So yeah. there's a, a real desire to be developing partnerships with people who are able to deliver those courses in conjunction with the academy. Is that, is that right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And another, another question on, on course content specifically, will the, will the academy include units on Indigenous cultural capability? It could. Um, so at the moment, um, we're only early days, and so there's, um, we're getting staff in. We've got 90 volunteers from across the service to come in to help do some of the thinking around the academy. So that supplements some of the people that are already here in the old Centre of Leadership and Learning. Um, they're actually looking through at what kind of suite of offerings we will have as part of the academy. Um, but if you've got ideas, you're welcome to actually send them through to the APSC and we'll make sure that the, um, the people that are actually looking at um, the policy development, I guess, of all of the courses um, has a look at, at um, your views and takes mm. them into account. Mm. And um, maybe as a follow-up to this, we'll send out some details on how people can um, get in touch with the, the team that are implementing the academy um, here at the APSC. Yeah. So uh, a question, there's a very, well, it's a very broad question for you, Mary, but I'll throw it to you. How do you see the future of the APS in Hobart and, Tas and Tasmania more broadly? So, um, so I probably um, can talk about more broadly um, because I think that it's not just specific to a particular location and this is because I think flexible work means that for the public service we do have to kind of think through what our what our kind of our business model is for our location and how we operate. As I said in the speech um, we had no idea that we could actually move people to working from home at scale. I'm the I'm in the chief operating officer committee which was make, making a lot of these decisions and working out what we did when we had to send people home and um, we were, we were sceptical and so when it all worked we were just so surprised and I think for us it pushed past a barrier to what we thought um, was our world. It, it just meant that a problem that we thought was constraining us is no longer there and so we can see and we can see through the responses to how people operated during the pandemic and their, the work that they did while they were actually working remotely that this opens up a whole new future for um, employment in the Australian Public Service, no matter of location. And it's the same within the private sector and what we're seeing um, within um, the industry and the major banks. Um, I think that to be competitive as an employer, we're going to have to think about more remote working and flexible working. And the agencies we know are already doing it now. Um, we've got about 20% of people that work flexibly. And here in the APSC, we're only 200 strong, but we actually have our posted offices working remotely in Tasmania. Um, we have someone in Melbourne. We have people up in, in um, Townsville. And, uh, you know, it's, it's been fantastic because we're tapping into talent pools that we normally wouldn't have. So for me, um, I can see a much more dispersed public service, I think, into the future. Hmm. Um, but in saying what I've just said, connection with people is still really important and so what we are seeing at the moment is people wanting to actually come in to actually see their colleagues and work with them. Um, being at home for a while is um, obviously was good um, but they really want that social connection and some of the types of roles that we do you almost need that particularly like what I'm in the policy space and I'm very mindful that some of our agencies aren't at the point yet where they could allow people to work remotely on um, for some of their functions. There are issues around some of the infrastructure IT and people in our security areas can't really work remotely at the moment. But um, I think you're probably always going to have presence in capital cities, but I'm hoping that you'll see more people to be able to actually um, work where they live, which would be great. And Ali, who you're going to meet on the, um, on the panel session, um, is working with us at the moment. She normally works with PM&C, 
and you'll see that she's actually sitting outside her beautiful house in Tasmania today. Um, thank you, thanks, thanks, Mary, for the for answering that so so fulsomely. Um, and I you've also, that, I think that probably means that I went too long. No, no, not at all, not at all. <laughs> Uh, and because you've, you've also asked, answered one of the questions that has, a, has popped up on the screen, which is whether flexible work will increase given the experience during COVID. So you've, you've addressed that yeah. directly as well. Um, a question about the professional streams. So you mentioned HR, data and digital professional streams. There's a question here, with so many employees working in service delivery, are there plans to have a service delivery professional stream? So um, this has been a question that we get asked um, from almost every kind of area within the service because now that we've got three professional streams, people are quite interested in what that means for the work that they do. Um, there is a lot of focus on um, the three at the moment and what we're trying to do is build deep capability in areas where we know that we actually um, are underdone within the service. So with the outsourcing of IT many, many years ago and the reliance on contractors and consultants, we know that in data and digital we really need to actually make a concerted effort to build our own capability and to provide career paths for people within the service because um, it's easy for them to actually get snaffled up also by the private sector. So that's why we actually chose data and digital and it's also the skill area that every agency in their agency survey fills out to say they're going to need more of in the future. So that's why we're focusing on those two. And we're focusing on HR because if we don't get strategic HR right, that's the enabler for anything else we want to do in the workforce. So that's why the three um, are the ones that we're focused on first. Um, the professions model is something that's come out of the UK. Um, Singapore also uses it. And they've had varying degrees of success. So what we're trying to do here is start slow, have a look at what we can do within those three, get the lessons learnt and review it and see whether we want to actually expand it to other streams. Um, in terms of service delivery, um, we are trying to do other things that aren't part of the, the professional kind of three streams at the moment, but we have um, graduates because that, um, so the graduate rotations that we have every year, um, from all agencies. We have a number of agencies that found that the graduate rotations out as part of Surge to Services Australia were so beneficial for their graduates that they want to actually embed it every year. And there's a lot of support for that and I suspect that what you'll start to see is that you'll have a new intake of people that come in and work for three or four months in service delivery that will be able to come back in at any time within the future and it just exposes more people across the service to what it's like working in service delivery and whether they want to kind of join and that there's a career path there for them. Um, and of course, we still want to build people's capabilities no matter where they, where they work and what kind of skills they have and that's something that the APS Academy will do. So again, long-winded question, but hopefully it was fulsome. Certainly fulsome Long Long-winded answer, I should say. Um, and look, I think we've just got time for one more question and it, it probably is a nice segue into the panel discussion which will focus on the personal reflections of the, of the panellists on the year that was. It's, it's been a difficult period and there's no doubt that across Australia and including the APS but certainly not limited mm. to the APS, it has been a difficult, difficult period. But what advice would you have specifically for APS employees who are struggling to cope with their workload? Yeah. So um, you've got to look after yourself as number one. And what we have found through the pandemic is a lot of public servants are staying long at work and the workload is just, it's just enormous at the moment. We've heard of people falling asleep at their desks at places like health because um, they feel like they, they need to make sure that things occur and they're so connected to what we're doing in terms of serving the Australian public. But I would say to every public servant, you need to focus on number one. And so for you, um, if you've got a lot of workload, you have to make sure that you're taking breaks because the workload's always going to be there. Um, so that you, you need to make sure you've got that balance between your personal life and your work. And that you've got to be pretty open and honest with your supervisor about what's achievable and what's not achievable. At the end of the day, the public service needs you for the longer term and we need you healthy. And so I would say um, flagging it as an issue, getting support and making sure that you've got balance and putting number one first, which is yourself. Excellent. Thank you for 
for that merit. That's, uh, that's really helpful. Um, and with that, I think we'll draw that, this part of, the, of today's event to a close. Um, thank you very much, Mary, for taking the time to be with us and for, for answering both fulsomely but also candidly, <laughs> um, because I think that is... Uh, people do appreciate the, your, your openness, and so thank you for that. Oh, I'm, right. losing my, I'm losing my little headset here. That's all so, right. Look, um, thank you, everybody, and it was lovely to have an opportunity to, to see you all today. And I'm leaving you with a fantastic panel for the next session. So thank you. Thank you. And that's a great, um, great segue into our panel discussion. So uh, we have three of our colleagues who are located in Tasmania with us this morning for a panel discussion on the topic of spirit of service. And um, this will pick up on some of the themes that have come through already on what, what, what does it mean to be a public servant and to be in some way, shape or form, playing a part in serving the people of Australia, the government and the people of Australia. So just a reminder that um, Slido remains available for people to put questions through directly to the panel, um, either to a specific panellist or to all three panel members. And, um, but the, 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 what we're really after today is to get some personal reflections from the panellists. So, um, uh, probably not the same nature of questions as we've been putting to Mary just now. So let me introduce our panellists for today. We have with us Dr Dirk Wellsford, who is Acting Chief Scientist for the Australian Antarctic Division, which is part of the Department of Agriculture, Water and the Environment. Originally from Melbourne, I understand, he uh, moved to Tasmania in the late 90s for his PhD studies and has been based there ever since. His main areas of scientific focus revolve around the sea, um, particularly marine ecology and conservation. His interests include the use of science and logic in developing resource use and conservation strategies, as well as the effective communication of science for use by policymakers and the role of human relationships in effective decision making. So thank you, Dirk, for being with us today. We also have Ali Jenkins, who's joining us from the porch outside her house, by the looks of things. Um, sunroom. Sunroom, excellent. Do you get sun down in Tasmania? Oh, sorry, no, I shouldn't say that. Um, so Ali joined the APS in 2004, and she's had roles in the Treasury, in communications. She's also worked in the Australian Antarctic Division and at the Department of the Prime Minister and Cabinet, where she headed up the offices of two former PMNC secretaries, Martin Parkinson and Michael Thorley. Ali was managing the Canberra-based APS reform office from Hobart from July last year, but as Mary mentioned, Ali's just recently come over to the APSC on secondment to lead one of the significant reform initiatives that's being implemented in response to the independent review of the APS. Ali's a relative newcomer to Tasmania. She moved to Hobart in January 2020 with her young family. So thank you, Ali, for joining us today. And lastly, we have Duncan Young, who heads up the National Data Acquisition Division at the Australian Bureau of Statistics. Duncan has a background in computer science and maths, and he spent the last 20 years or so working for government statistical agencies in Australia and New Zealand. Here in Australia, he's led and delivered some really significant projects, including both the 2017 Marriage Law Postal Survey and the 2016 Census of Population and Housing, i.e. The, the, the census for most of us. We just call it the census, I guess, <laughs> whereas the ABS does a number of, a number of censuses, but for those outside the ABS, it's, it's the big one. Um, Duncan has also provided technical and advisory support to the governments of Vietnam, the UK, Myanmar and Indonesia, as well as the United Nations. So thanks, Duncan, for being with us today. So, Absolute pleasure. So look, we, we've got some pre-prepared questions for the panellists, but please don't hesitate to, to put questions through using Slido, and uh, we'll move to them after we've uh, gone through some of the pre-prepared ones. And the first question for our panellists, and I think I'll, I'll go to Duncan first, is just would you mind reflecting very briefly on, 
on the topic for today's discussion, which is spirit of service. What does that, what does that mean to, for you? What does that look like for you, Duncan? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Phil. Well, um, well for, for me, the, the spirit of service is, is when we are coming to work for, uh, knowing what we're, what we're doing that for, really thinking about the, the people that make a, a difference to and the, the community and how the community is impacted by, by our work. So, so when we get to that point where we're not counting the minutes in the day or the, uh, to exactly what's in our job description, but really sort of going beyond that. And so for me, um, the spirit of service was really clear in the last year. Um, clearly that the pandemic's had such a such a huge impact on our, our community, our society, our economy. And the ABS's role oh, was to really try and step up in that space and make sure that we had the information we needed for the health departments, for the um, businesses in the country, for the, the key central policy makers, but the key information that helps us make the decisions, which I think has helped Australia respond, one of the best responses in the world to the pandemic. Okay, excellent. Thanks for that. Um, Ali, what about you? What, what spirit of service mean to you? Well, I'm with Duncan on that finding, um, finding meaning in your work through connecting it uh, with people through improving lives in Australia. That's core. You have to be able to find a way to really connect what you do with um, other Australians and, and find a way to make a, contribu a contribution that improves lives. Uh, um, the other thing is you've got to, I, I think it's really important to be doing something where you feel like you're creating a positive change, however small that is. Um, anything you can do to directly impact someone's life in a positive way um, is incredibly rewarding. Um, and then the only other thing I would add in the spirit of service is about how we are there for each other as public servants. Um, uh, I'm a big believer um, in the idea that we should be able to bring our whole selves to work. Um, so how can we create the most supportive environment so we, we can bring our whole selves to work and, and we, we can really focus on what's important, which is, is making an impact. Excellent. No, it's really, really, um, what's the word? Really important insight there. Thank you for that. Um, and Dirk, we'll go to you. Spirit of service. What yeah, does that look hi, like for, for you? So, well, so reflecting on this question because um, you sent it to me beforehand. Thank you very much. Um, so my spirit of service comes from um, my um, values, and my values come from a lot from my family history. So you know, my grandfather fought in World War Two. Um, you know, when he was a very young man, he volunteered to go and fight um, over in Tobruk and then in New Guinea. Um, and that had a really session on me, the idea that a young man would actually go and, you know, potentially put his life at risk um, in the service of um, a concept um, like Australia. Um, and my parents were, my mother was a teacher and my father was a police officer in Victoria. And so I actually saw their um, service and that was very me growing up. Um, and very inspiring. So the idea, again, that they would devote a lot of their time and energy um, when they weren't trying to bring up me and my brother um, to, to making people's lives better. And, you know, I saw the challenges they faced. Um, you know, it was in the western suburbs of, of Melbourne where there was a lot of socioeconomic disadvantage. And, you know, really, they were both on the front of trying to, to make people's lives better and, and make a difference. So, um, yeah, when I got the opportunity to embark on a career, I was really wanting to find a way of um, honouring their service. So that's a, a nice lead into, I guess, the next question, which I'll throw to you straight away, Dirk, which is, is that really then the key factor that prompted you to join the APS? Um, it, 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 was a, it was a journey. So, I mean, I, I was always very motivated to study the natural world. So, you know, from a very young age, I, I loved science and, and, you know, the Australian environment is amazing. You know, you can step out, I can look out my window and see endemic species that, that only exist in Tasmania and, and therefore, are, you know, part of um, a really precious thing for Australians in the world. Um, but then 
sort of as I as I matured, went to university, and sort of became exposed to, to more ideas. Um, you know, it became clear that what I wanted to do was make sure that the science I did was was something that could be applied um, and could be understood by the broadest amount of people possible, so that they could use that information to make make decisions um, to make a difference in the real world. So you know, I'm, I'm I'm really driven to to serve the Australian public, but I but really through conserving um, the environment because, you know, I see the environment as a stakeholder in all the decisions we're making. We really need to make sure that it's um, looked after because it delivers services to us. Um, so, yeah, but basically once I had opportunities after study to, to go into work with it, where I could see there was direct application, I ended up with the state government and then an opportunity came up the AAD and moved across to here. Hmm, excellent. Okay, thanks for that. Ali, what about you? What uh, prompted you to join the APS? Well, um, look, so I grew up in Canberra, but I did not grow up in a public service <laughs> family, um, uh, which is kind of strange. Um, I, uh, my, my dad is a carpenter. Um, I come from a family of tradies. And I just didn't really, I, I knew the public service existed. Um, but it just wasn't part of my world growing up. Um, uh, I went to uni and I, I, I studied development study. So what I wanted to do was go overseas, work in um, aid programs, uh, you know, work in activities that would support women's health um, in, in developing countries. Uh, that's what I wanted to do. Um, but as I was sort of finishing uni, um, I saw a short term contract at the Treasury and I thought, oh, this is great. I'll be able to do this over summer. Um, it was a service delivery role. It was answering a foreign investment hotline um, and also processing foreign investment applications. Um, and this was actually pretty wild time because any time I picked up the phone, um, well, most of the time, it, it was just somebody who wanted to buy a house in Australia and, um, you know, wanted, had to go through this process. Um, but sort of every hundredth time, it could be Clive Palmer yelling at us or Gina Reinhart yelling at us um, because it was sort of right at the start of the point when um, sort of Chinese foreign investment was, uh, you know, a big deal in our mining sector. Um, that was a really incredible experience for me because... I was talking to people every day and being able to buy a house when you are newly arrived in a country, that's a really important thing. Um, uh, so my first job in the public service really gave me this strong sense of connection. Um, and then I just kind of tripped along. I'm pretty kind of happy-go-lucky. I lived overseas uh, for a bit with my um, husband and then we came back to Australia and um, I, I got a job working in TV policy at the Department of Communications um, and, and that was the dream, working on TV policy, it just couldn't get any better. Uh, but then uh, I ended up um, taking a role at PM&C about 12 years ago and I just really felt at home. Um, so much has changed during that time both in government and in PM&C. Um, and I wasn't expecting to stay, I, I was expecting to sort of head back overseas, live the dream, <laughs> working in development, and it just never happened. Um, I think it's because I had so many rewarding experiences uh, working at pm and I had so many different things that I felt like I could contribute to. Um, um, and now that I'm in Tasmania, uh, it's this whole other kind of evolution of, of ways of seeing the public service um, and, I don't know, just being part of something that's a bit bigger. Mm. Excellent. Thanks for that. Um, and Duncan, for you, what, what brought you into the APS? Yeah, thanks, Phil. Um, I, I wish I was half as noble as, as Ali and Dirk. Like, um, uh, for, for me, um, so I, I did grow up in, in Hobart and... Um, I really didn't want to go to the mainland and 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 leave, and so to location and and a job came available in Hobart. Pay seemed pretty good compared to the sort of 
uh, part-time casual work I'd been doing. Um, I was still a student at the time at, at UTAS, and so so I just yeah I thought I'd give this a go. I thought Australian Bureau of Statistics will probably just give me a good spreadsheet, and I can sit in a corner and not have to talk to people and and play around with some numbers, which which was living a dream for me. Um, and so yeah, so that's sort of how it started. And I'm, I joke sometimes that I. I sort of joined for the money, but I stayed despite the money. So, so I, as the years went on, and yet I probably could have gone into the private sector, particularly in the technology field, which is sort of my background. Um, it, it started being more important to me as I guess I grew up a little bit and matured a bit and noticed what the work we we're part of. But I actually really, yeah, loved the, the people I was working with and the, the service that we were making. And so, yeah, it's been a an amazing sort of journey over it's yeah over 20 years now now for me and um but yeah certainly I, I won't lie and say that I joined because I, I knew what the ABS did or knew what the APS did or, or that was some kind of um yeah to pre predetermined kind of purpose it was yeah at the first paycheck at the first paycheck this, this reveals a little bit about my I, 20 year old self my, my first paycheck i spent to the dollar at the local electrical store on the largest tv that i could get out of there and this is in a day of um cathode ray tubes like, like i'm not sure my back has ever quite recovered from carrying that tv home i had to live on noodles for the next fortnight i but i i ate those noodles looking at that tv but um I'd like to think I've grown up a little bit more since then. That's, um, that's great. Thanks, Duncan, for that uh, inspiring, those inspiring words. <laughs> but, but in all seriousness, though, there is no, there's no wrong answer to the question. I think that was really highlighted at the launch event for this Roadshow series where we had a Deputy Secretary from PM&C, whom Ali knows well, who, when asked this question, said it was simply because the APS, she could get a job. The APS was an employer who was willing to employ her with an arts degree. And, um, <laughs> and she, she was very open about that. And I think, but went on to say something similar, actually, Duncan, which is that since then, you know, she then outlined her experience and what has kept her in the APS and some of what she's learnt. And, and, and um, so I think that's one of, the, one of the things we're trying to highlight through this series of, of events and these panel discussions is simply the, the, the diversity of the roles and the diversity of backgrounds that people bring. And that extends to the, you know, the reasons why people joined up in the first place. So thank you for, um, for sharing that. OK, well, next question. Um, what's been your proudest moment during your APS career? And, uh, and Dirk, we might go to you first on this one as well. What's been your proudest moment during your, your career in the APS? Um, I mean, one of, the, one of the great things that motivates me to get out of bed in the morning and come into my job is the things that I'm proud of. Um, but I mean, recently, I mean, one thing I really like is, is um, giving recent graduates their first job. I, I really enjoy that. You know, when you go through a recruitment process, you've got a really interesting job, and then you pick someone who's really good, and they, you know, they really take the ball and run with it. That's that's. I'm really proud when that happens. Um, another thing that we did, going back to the whole pandemic issue, one of the things I was proud of last year, and and Ali was here uh, helping us at the time, was. Um, we actually used our, because we, we have labs here, and we used our stock of ethanol to, to make some hand sanitizer, and we donated it to the Salvos. Um, you know, and that was, a, that was a really, you know, a proud moment because it was the way that the, you know, us as a public service could, you know, really directly um, assist the community when it was in crisis. Um, you know, and normally the other viewed as this, you know, icebergs and penguins kind of focused area, but, you know, it was great to be able to, to do something really, really direct like that. Thanks for that. I icebergs and penguins, is that the sort of internal shorthand for what you do, or is that that's the external perspective? Um, look, I, I would say um, that's certainly the external perception. I mean, we're, we're chipping away at that. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's certainly the case that um, outside of Hobart, I think people are a little bit mystified as to what we do sometimes. Um, but yeah, I mean, we, we do all sorts of really important things um, in terms of trying to understand how the Antarctic influences Australia. 
you know, Antarctica really drives a lot of Australia's climate and weather. Um, and so studying the Antarctic is going to help us be able to what's going to happen um, in a day. But yeah, we're certainly looking at penguins as well. So, you know, that's fine. And um, I, I would um, mention to everyone who's watching this that the um, AAD does have a presence on social media, quite an extensive presence, and there's some really interesting little um, little snippets, little vignettes, including some with you yourself, Dirk, explaining different aspects of what the what the work you do and how it does impact more broadly on not just on on Australia, but then also on understanding global uh, climate drivers and other other factors. So. Look that up on, on Twitter and, and other social media platforms if you, if you have the opportunity. Um, uh, Ali, to you, your proudest moment in the, in the public service. Um, so I'm a bit like Dirk. I, um, you know, it's great being able to offer someone a job. I also love it when I have a team member who absolutely nails it in a meeting um, when they're leading on a particular issue. I love seeing, um, you know, I love seeing the win on their face. Um, uh, uh, being able to kind of be a part of some different historical moments, too many PM changes than I'd, I'd wish to recall. Um, but there's actually one moment um, that really sticks out in my mind and I'm hoping I'm not going to steal your thunder, Duncan. Um, uh, so uh, in my time at PMNC, so much has changed um, in the way that people can identify, um, you know, different parts of their, their lives and personalities. When I started, there's no way that there would have been a pride network at PMNC or a call network or a women's network, all of those things have happened um, in more recent years. Um, but there was this one event that uh, the PMNC pride network ran on the day that the marriage uh, equality survey results were announced. And there was this big room at PMNC, somebody had got a rainbow cake and we didn't know what the results were going to be. You would have known Duncan, um, but we had a sense of where things were going to go. And when it was announced, the room just erupted. Um, and I was in a room with my colleagues and it was this, it was just this incredibly rewarding moment. I was so proud kind of of Australia. I was so proud of what the APS had been able to achieve. And I was also, I just, I was just so proud to be part of a community um, where we could sort of, we can embrace equality in that way. Um, so it's not like that was something that I was responsible for in any way, but it, it, it really speaks to me as a moment when I was just incredibly proud. Awesome. Thanks, And good Ali. job, Duncan. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it's, a, it, it's a perfect segue to Duncan um, who delivered that. Um, and, and, and my understanding, Duncan, is that you were literally the person who was in charge of making that survey happen. Is that, is that correct? Uh, obviously, it was a, a big team effort. And, um, yeah. I was a, the program manager for the survey, but we had um, an amazing group of people from, I think, 14 different agencies sort of come together to, to work on that. And um, yeah, to have, as part of a multidisciplinary task force of about 99 people. But um, yeah, it, it is a nice segue because obviously there's some, some real pride for, for me and for us on the way that we, we did what was a really difficult and challenge thing, challenging thing, both logistically, but also to do really sensitively and respectfully because it's a, it was a really hard time for, for, a, for a number of members of our community as we, we worked through that. But for me, um, I'll zoom in on, on a little piece of that. Um, it, people will remember probably the year before was um, the, the census fail, oh, as it was called, of 2016. And we, we told everyone to get online on August 9. Well, but a year on, on August 9, we were getting together, uh, some of my, my census people and me to have a drink and to sort of um, say, well, we survived the year, we, we got the census out, out. And it was that day that the, 
the Prime Minister contacted our department and said, hey, Day, um, yet, are you ready to go again? We've got this um, marriage law survey to run. And the, the headline in the paper the next day in Sydney was um, census, census bunglers from hopeless Bureau of Statistics to run plebiscite. So that, so that was sort of our um, <laughs> sort of preamble. And, um, and so probably my proudest moment was that in the, in the first day, a, a, on that first day, I, I reached out to a number of people um, within the agency, the outside the agency, and some stakeholders, representatives of the um, Council of the Aging, Seniors Australia, the culturally and linguistically diverse groups, and said, hey, I need your help. We've got 99 days here to, to deliver something which has never been done before. We need to yeah, produce 64 million items and get them dispatched in 20 days. We need to get TV advertising running in 36 hours. We need a call centre up and running in about 50 hours, thanks to colleagues from Services Australia on the call for help with that. And every single person I sort of went to and approached said, hey, absolutely we want to work uh, on this we, we want to work with you and we'll get this done and so so it was a real for me a, a real sense of, of pride in the, the service and the service that's in in our, our staff but also a real pride in the it's knowing that the, if you invest in relationships and people and, and respecting others they'll, they'll want to work with you or for you in the future and so so that was a i guess but, yeah, to get, getting the band together at the start uh, was, was a really proud moment and, and uh, without that group, we wouldn't have, have delivered. Yeah, excellent. And um, did the media, was there a follow-up media saying that correcting that initial article about the hopeless census bunglers or...? Probably not. <laughs> no, no, no. You tend not to, to sell that many headline <laughs> newspapers with, um, yeah, yeah, very... Impressive statisticians <laughs> deliver on time and $40 million under budget. No, no, it, it doesn't happen. <laughs> which is a pity in one sense, but is also, it picks up on something that a panellist at a previous event said, which is maybe the real measure of success is for the APS is when things happen without people noticing and um, sort of emphasising that idea that, that as public servants, a lot of what we do does fly under the radar. Um, it doesn't make it any less meaningful, but it does... Um, and it's a good thing when people, people's lives just work and, and sort of function thanks to the public service without them realising um, the, the, you know, what the army of public servants is actually doing to, um, to facilitate that. Um, let's move to, uh, to COVID and, um, because that is a, obviously a, a, a huge sort of part of the, the year that was and it's been... Um, it's been a challenging year. It's been a, a, a year of innovation in many, many respects. So I'd, um, I guess there are two sides to the question. The first one is really something positive in your work or in your workplace that, uh, that has come out of the response to COVID-19. And we'll go to you first again, Dirk. Um, probably, correct me if I'm wrong, but the workplaces that AAD has to manage are among the most... Uh, potentially the most challenging and the most diverse in the public service. Yeah, look, it, it, it was certainly um, challenging. We, we have a, a polar medical unit here. Um, we've been in the development of COVID-19 in China from the end of 2019. So we actually had, we'd already been talking about a crisis management response to COVID-19 before a lot of other parts of government or business. Um, and that was mainly because our concern was for people down south. You know, we can't provide um, high levels of medical people in Antarctica. We have very conservative but also, you know, being really, really careful to keep any diseases out of, you know, to, uh, sick enough ventilation, um, we really couldn't do that down south and we can't evacuate them in the middle of winter. Like, there's there's no way we can actually get logistics in and out. So, um, yeah, we we were working on a COVID response, you know, by January in 2020 and then, you know, everybody else... So we, we could see sort of everybody else catching up and, and starting to um, develop 
the policies and procedures. Um, one, of the, one of the real positive things I think that's come out of COVID for, for me and for the AA leads, one is um, through the sort of sending everybody home and, you know, asking them to work from home, it really highlighted that the, the experience of women in this organisation is much more challenging than um, we was assumed. We responsibility of being mixed in with working from and so um, it was great, sort of ironically, that at that we were able to start to have more conversations around, well, we achieve the work life that, um, that Mary about um, and I'd sort of have caring responsibilities, you know, when they're, when they're trying to work at home. The other really positive thing that I saw is that it, it changed um, the way that science is used by government. Like it, it really, you know, science shot back to the top of um, people's attention to sort of say, well, look, you know, the reason why Australia's managed COVID-19 so successfully is because they've listened to um, you know the the experts uh, and their advice on what the evidence and you can you know between what happened in the US where the science really that it needed and mm. you know it was it was catastrophic so you know there's nothing you know in particular about being a, a you know an advanced economy um, or anything like that that means that you can deal with COVID well. It really was that Australia and, you know, our colleagues in New Zealand really said, well, you know, we're going to listen to the scientists. And um, as a result, we've had nowhere near the impact um, on our economy or, or on people um, that some of those other countries have had. Hmm. I, I'm, I'm hoping, that, um, you know, we we can let, continue to, you know, let's listen to the scientists, let's look at the, look at the, um, the data and use that um, in making decisions. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I think it's the two go hand in hand, don't they? There's both the science side of things, but then also, you know, the data and and the, the and the analysis of the data, which has been which has featured really heavily in certainly in the government's decision making, um, government at all levels, mm. um, decision making in response to to the the pandemic. Um, what about you, Duncan? What uh, coming out of COVID nineteen for for the ABS or for you personally? What's something really positive that that's come out of that for you? Yeah, Phil. I'd I'd like to acknowledge that clearly the COVID nineteen has had a lot of tragedy and and it probably has will have a tale of some mental health health challenges and issues exacerbated across the country that we'll need to work on, but. Yeah, I think it is it's good to try and also look at the, the silver linings and the, the benefits which have come from it. And, and for me, I think um, it, it's really the open the eyes of, of a number of people on Australia's North Island up there with you, Phil, around the, <laughs> the ability and power of um, uh, video conferencing and, and virtual kind of, of work. Um, yeah, to, I think that the APS has always been in quite progressive in, in its approaches and the, the fact that I've been supported to work from Tassie is an example of that but it used to be a, a work from Tassie but the jump on a plane I mean, every second week or so and, and I, I think that we've really learned it's challenged some of those those thoughts and beliefs about our world yet one and can what can we do but also what things actually work better and um and so even things like this session today um uh, the ability for people to connect in from across Hobart, from across Tasmania, with a sort of equal experience, um, and then and not have sort of travel time, parking time, all of those those issues and challenges, and and certainly um, I think there's been a um, a greater equality in access to, to information um, and opportunities which have come about by that. So at the moment, the, the ABS is involved with a whole lot of meetings with the, the United Nations and the Statistical Commission that we work with to try and make sure data is comparable all across the world. And usually, um, yeah, one of our deputies or the Australian statistician would have been in on a flight across to, to New York or to, to Geneva to, to be part of those meetings. But now, Dow, um, unfortunately, we don't get on those, those lovely flights, but you get the, 
ability for lots of people to be involved with that international and global community and participate mm -hmm. in those conversations. And you actually end up with a, the subject matter expert rather than someone who has to try and cover a broad range of areas. Mm, yeah, yeah, no, that's absolutely right. And just picking up on your comment about people being able to participate in these sessions on an equal footing, for our Victoria session uh, a couple of days ago, we had someone speaking from Melbourne, someone speaking from Geelong, someone speaking from Bendigo, and we had almost 300, uh, I think it was almost 300 people connected, which is far more than we would have ever had if we'd run one face-to-face -face session you know, in somewhere in, in the CBD of Melbourne or, or in Geelong. So um, while we, you know, we value, previously we valued the opportunity to get out and travel and for people to actually engage with people and connect with people face to face, there's no doubt that you're absolutely right. This is opening up, you know, new avenues for reaching more people who actually want to participate and engage with this sort of event. So it's a, it's a really good point. Um, I'm conscious of time, actually. So, Ali, I'm not going to put to you the question about the, the COVID question. I'm actually going to go to one of the questions that's come in on Slido, which um, I think picks up on something that you yourself said, which is about the importance of connecting the work you do to the community that ultimately we are serving. So, have you ever, is that something that you've ever found difficult? Have you ever struggled to, to find a way to connect, make that connection? Yes, definitely. And this is one of the, the things I was really focused on in moving to Tasmania, actually. So um, uh, for three years in PM, it's on the federal budget. And I absolutely flogged myself. Um, uh, I'm not uh, an, an economist. I was sort of just working in a general sort of policy advice role on the government's fiscal strategy. And it was incredibly long hours, um, lots of battles. I gained a huge amount out of it. But when I looked back on that time, I couldn't really remember what impact I had. Um, and it just seemed really disproportionate to me um, how much I'd flogged myself um, and just this, I just, I just, I just couldn't understand why I did it. Um, I don't know if I had any real impact on our fiscal strategy or our budget. Um, we still haven't returned to surplus. Um, and obviously um, there's always lots of little things that, that make up a bigger picture. Um, but but when, I, when I look back on that time and three years in my life um, where my... Um, you know, I missed family events or um, I, my husband spent a lot of time waiting for me in the PMNC car park. I think I probably could have made some better choices. <laughs> um, and if, if I had picked a role um, that had more of a kind of direct connection with, um, with the actual people, um, uh, you know, I, I feel like I, uh, I, I could have made a better contribution. Okay, so that, that's, that's an interesting reflection because there's no doubt that we need, I mean, do we, there's probably a question as to whether we need people to be flogging themselves um, to, <laughs> yeah, to deliver Yeah, probably deliver don't budgets. need people to flog themselves. So that, yeah. But if we put that to one side, there are a variety of roles where the connection, you know, the, the line of sight, if you like, through to the, the Australian public is, is less clear. So with the benefit of hindsight, how would you, what advice would you give someone who, who might be struggling to... To, to, to see that line of sight through to the, the ultimate stakeholder, which is the, the Australian community? Ooh, uh, I don't know. This is probably not great advice, <laughs> but uh, I think you've got to find a way to, to find that connection or see that connection, or you need to think about what you're doing. Um, mm. Maybe find something else to do. Um, uh, yeah. It, I don't think that's great advice. <laughs> I don't want people to sort of like ditch their jobs, uh, but I really think it's important to find a way uh, to have that connection. And sometimes you'll have roles where you personally get a lot out of that experience um, and you face, you face a lot of challenges um, and that's great for you. Um, but I'm not sure if that's something that is a great thing to do forever. Okay, oh, that's, 
thanks for being open and, and honest about that. Well, what about you, Dirk? Have you ever, you, have you ever struggled to draw the line back to the, the Australian public in terms of, I guess, the, the particularly technical aspects of what you do? No, never. No. Okay. <laughs> no, look, of course. And, and you know, the, I mean, the, the, the script, Ellie's um, story resonates strong with me and I think it would resonate strongly with, with many um, people in the public service. I mean, it, it's it, working in a team, you know, and, and working really hard, it can be pretty, you become, you, you're devoted to your team, you're, um, you know, you want to work, help each other, you know, to get through difficult times and, you know, it's exciting to, to be working that to, you know, there's something important, you know, like I can imagine on the budget, you know, you'd be thinking, well, this is, you know, this, okay. this is historic stuff, you know, this is something that really um, has the potential to be really influential. And, you know, I've certainly got caught up in, in things like that. I mean, I, I, I get caught up in things like that now, you know, I'm, I'm, I can get caught up in my inbox, you know, I'll, I'll sit there and I will email you know, maybe the the thing I really, really should be focusing, and always thinking, you know, lift, you know, you've got to lift your, your sight all the time and sort of go, well, is this really taking me and you know the AAD um, where it should be going? It, you know, what is this on in the service of all of this furious activity and hard work? Um, just you just got to check in regularly with yourself and say, you know, is this really taking us? in the right direction hmm. um, and the other thing is you know you, you, you want to try and set yourself up so having a good day set yourself up you've you, you write write a few on the post it notes so when you're having a bad day you can go All right that's what i'm sure i should be supposed to be doing just sort of you know um be a little bit kinder to yourself and give yourself some support yeah okay excellent i think that's really good advice and that's probably um, a, a nice lead into the next question, which I'll put to you, Duncan, which is about how you've been looking after yourself and your team's well-being um, during, you know, this past year, which has been which has been challenging. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think in, across the APS, there's a lot of people quite tired uh, at the moment, and people have have shown that spirit of service and gone above and beyond, but also that. The impacts of um, uncertainty on on sort of yeah, planning your life, being able to see loved ones, being able to catch up with family. It, it's been a real, real tough period and continues to be so. Oh, and um, most of my team are actually be based in Victoria. So to, I, I sort of manage an office of staff in Geelong and a number of staff across Victoria. And so I've been really conscious that they've had a particularly rough time um, with uh, sort of a multiple lockdowns once during the year. And so we've tried to do um, a combination of, of individual kind of initiatives to, to encourage people to um, have the freedom and the opportunity and the permission and the support to to do what's right for them. And so when they were at home with, with kids that they needed to care for because the schools were closed and stuff, being open about the fact that and some days won't be 100% productive, some days you won't be able to do things. And so giving that kind of personal permission, but also trying to do some institutional things. And so, so one of the institutional things that we did last year was we have one Friday or one Monday a month, we'd declare as a take a break day and so what would happen on a take a break day is that we'd cancel all the institutional meetings so people's diaries would be sort of free and that gave a, a couple of opportunities it gave an opportunity for staff to to take a day off if they had some built up some flex hours or um, they wanted to use some of their annual leave and they weren't feeling like they were going to miss out on something or, or let people down but it also gave them a chance to to get out of a the routine of what they had been doing. And, and so t we do have some direct service kind of areas in my team. And so they would just space it over two days. So half the team on, on a Friday and half the team on a Monday. And we'd sort of just manage that to try and create the space, but probably just as importantly, create the ability to have the conversation about our, the, the things we need to do to look after ourselves, to look after each other. And that, yeah, we're not, 
we're not superheroes and we're not superhuman. And um, yeah, it, it, it's okay to say, hey, hey, I need to have an afternoon off, or I think think it'd be better if I, yeah, to try worked on something different for a while. Hmm. Thanks for that, Duncan. And that that sort of ties in nicely with what Mary was saying earlier about making sure that you do take the time to look after yourself. Um, because fundamentally that, you know, if you fall over, then the work's not going to get done. So you have to, you have to invest in yourself. Look, we're, we're just about out of time, so I'm going to go to the last question, um, which I, I, I want to put to each one of you, which is one piece of advice you would give your younger self um, if you could go back in time to when you first joined the APS. Um, what, would you, what would you say, Ali, to your younger self? Um, I used to agonise over anything I would say in meetings and I would, after the meeting, I'd be like, oh God, everyone thinks I'm an idiot. What was I thinking? Um, I would first of all say to myself, oh, you are an idiot. <laughs> Don't worry about everyone else. You're here in this position because um, you need to be able to speak up and um, contribute your ideas. Um, and I'd also say to anyone else who's sort of sitting out there thinking, should I say something in this meeting? Um, you know, go for it. Most people in the room, they're not thinking about, they're not really thinking about you. They're thinking about your ideas. Um, they want good ideas so we can all do a good job. Um, and, and you know what, like you, you don't want to be in a situation where you could have said something and you didn't. And then, you know, Things things don't don't work out. Um, so so do what you can to to kind of speak up um, and um, be comfortable with that. Awesome, that's that's great advice. Thanks, Ali. What about you, Dirk? Oh. I encourage you to um, learn more about the APS earlier. So it's it's. It's a very big and diverse organisation and, um, you know, I'm learning more about it every day. Um, the other thing I would say is, you know, don't listen to the, um, the voices out there that um, this sort of self-loathing bureaucrat sort of vibe sometimes occurs where we public servants in Australia can beat themselves up a little bit. Um, yeah, so don't indulge voice, um, proud. Um, public servant and you know about how proud you are of what you've achieved hmm, excellent. Um, that's what I do excellent no that's great thanks for that and, and Duncan we'll finish up with you one piece of advice for your younger self yeah, thanks Phil um, it, uh, probably in a in a work context uh, I would have just said um, you you've actually made some really good choices here it, it just yeah stick with it and um yeah keep keep taking on on opportunities when you see them and don't be afraid to take them on and yeah you're actually yeah to just continue believing in yourself and believing in the other people who believe in you and so to, um, i've been incredibly lucky i think and also get a trolley jack when you move that tv <laughs> <laughs> Look, that's a that's a great that's a great note to end on. So, because um, we've we've we're going we've gone forty nine seconds over time, um, which is my mistake, my fault. But I think it's been worth it to uh, to get um, those reflections from each one of you. So, look, thank you very much to all three of you, to Dirk, Duncan, and Ali. Um, what we were trying to do through this discussion was to showcase some of the diversity of roles, but also the common ethos of service that underpins what it is that we do in the APS. And I think that has come through really clearly. So thank you very much. Thank you to everyone who has been participating virtually, who's tuned, people who've tuned in, who've put questions through. And, um, and look, we'll leave it at that. Have a great day and um, look forward to engaging with you at, you know, at future events, either virtually or in person. So thanks very much.